the assembling model creatures, race cars, and airplanes. But unlike the rest of the kids, these model makers never grow up. They go on to build the mothership, and the Millennium Falcon, the Red October, and the Starship Enterprise. Creating the impossible with precision detail, it's the model makers who make the star hardware for the world's most popular films. Their work is usually shrouded with secrecy, but today some of Hollywood's most gifted model makers are going to beam you up for a look at a mile-long space station and a battle scene being created for Star Trek Deep Space Nine. It's the final frontier of special effects on movie magic. Scale models and miniatures have been an integral part of the film industry since French filmmaker Georges Méliès made a trip to the moon in 1902. Early miniatures were used to recreate historic events, such as the Battle of Manila Bay, made by Vitagraph at the turn of the century. Back then, effects came from such unexpected sources as the producer's cigars. In the 1920s, German filmmaker Fritz Lang brought model making to new heights in his groundbreaking science fiction epic, Metropolis. This landmark film took almost two years to complete. It's been said that it required some 5,000 feet of miniature roadways and skyscrapers, costing half of the film's then outrageous budget of $2 million. In the ensuing years, it was the model makers who gave us the cinematic visions of New York City, and Gotham City, Frankenstein's castle, and Dracula's castle, the Hindenburg, and the Nautilus, the Terminator, the Ghostbusters Marshmallow Man, and one of the most famous models of all time, the Starship Enterprise. The original Enterprise was conceived by Star Trek creator Gene Roddenberry and the effects team supervised by Howard Anderson, Jr. With uh, Matt Jeffries uh, designing uh, the uh, Enterprise, it took oh, probably three months of uh, working with uh, Dick Dayton uh, to evolve the materials and how to build the Enterprise. I built the model out of wood uh, for Gene's approval. And once he saw it, he made some changes. And um, from that point on, I made the large model, which was four times the size of the smaller one. And we're talking about uh, the large one being 12 feet long, give or take a, a few inches. When Star Trek The Next Generation exploded on the scene in 1987, effects supervisor Rob Legato was called in to create the effects for the updated version of the classic series. Legato and fellow supervisor Dan Curry manned the bridge for the first five seasons of The Next Generation. Their spectacular work on that series earned them Emmy Awards in 1992. One of the biggest challenges working on Star Trek is, is uh, you have no idea what's going to come up in the next week, so you don't get a chance to plan and, and come up with these great ways of doing things you have to do it on the cuff and the hard part is sometimes it's extremely challenging and, and would you rather spend two weeks designing it or three weeks designing it, you have a couple hours because they want a budget by noon before star trek legato honed his skills making commercials like this one with the renowned robert abel and associates shots involving models have always been his specialty the great thing about uh, shooting models is, uh, as opposed to computer graphics is that you can get into a happy accident. A light can hit something a particular way and you take advantage of that. And in computers, you don't necessarily do that. You have to plan for that accident. Now, with Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Rob is faced with an entirely new set of challenges. It will require some of the most elaborate models and miniatures ever built for television. By far the most important model in the series is the Deep Space Nine space station. A mile-long outpost at the furthest reaches of Federation space, the space station was conceived by production designer Herman Zimmerman. 
and executive producers Michael Piller and Rick Berman. Supervising the construction and filming of the model is effects producer Legato, who must plan and execute every effect sequence in the show. Once they showed me what it is they want to do, then we got into uh, practicality of it and how big something like that needs to be, what we actually will make, and what's actually needed to get the show done. The man Rob chose to make the space station was Tony Meininger, a multi-talented model maker with a keen eye for precision. When we first uh, approached Tony about the model, uh, the key word was, was getting as much detail and as, as many small lights on the ship as possible to make it look absolutely enormous. Tony sets to work with his versatile team of model makers. His crew first constructs 40 blanks, carefully detailed pieces made of wood, styrene plastic, and plexiglass. When the blanks are finished, they are cast into silicone molds. These molds will be used to create many duplicate space station pieces. The duplicate pieces are cast in epoxy glass, the material of choice because of its strength and stability. Epoxy glass is also lightweight and easy to cast in its liquid form. Once the pieces have set, they are sanded and carefully touched up by hand. The model is painted using durable automotive lacquers and then aged with textured layers of finishing paint. In its final construction phase, custom manufactured neon tubing is placed inside the model sections to generate the station's interior lighting. Like that. If you look where I'm looking, you know, if you look, you're looking from above, look, look from my eyes so you don't see the bulb. So are these ever going to get pulled out? I guess not. No, they're permanent. More than a thousand fiber optic strands are added to carry the illumination to the windows. You can see there's lots of little holes in here. Those will get drilled out a little larger, and then a fiber optic filament will be put in there. Neon illuminates the fiber optic so that you see the glow on the outside of the, the ship. Now you have to look at the instruction booklet. Made from some 2,000 individual pieces, the space station is durable yet surprisingly lightweight. Because of its hollow steel frame and epoxy exterior, the entire model weighs only 100 pounds. When the space station is finally completed, it is taken from the model shop to Image G, an effects studio in Hollywood, where it will be powered up and filmed. The first time the station got plugged in, it was, it was terrifying. It was beautiful. It was, you know, everything that we wanted creatively on the station, except that it was enormous. And I looked at my list of 86 shots that I have to do with this station and just, like, got a knot in my stomach. It's like, how am I going to pull all this off? I think we get that to work, Eric. The technology that Rob uses is a motion control camera system which moves smoothly around the model, giving the illusion that the station is flying through space. You actually took what you did last time, the first and the second one, and combined them, the first being where you see almost all of the underneath. Now, what was that comment again on camera? It's fine to me. Yeah. <laughs> Carrie? Great. Okay. Yeah. Yeah? Very, very nice. Finally, on film, the space station model looks convincingly realistic. Rob's next stop is Paramount Studios in Hollywood. Here on stage 18, he works with director David Carson on the live action filming that will be combined with the space station shots. This team also uses a motion control camera system. The key to the system is a computer which controls the movements of the camera. This allows the filmmakers to save any camera move in the computer and repeat it precisely as many times as needed. After the shot is set up and rehearsed, the actors are brought in and the scene is completed in just a few takes. When the motion control work is finished, Rob will put a shot of the space station into the blue screen window. Blue screens are frequently used as temporary backgrounds for shots using miniatures. When the filming is complete, the blue is electronically removed and replaced with a shot of the model. 
The blue screen and motion control processes allow the filmmakers to create a moving camera shot of the actors with the space station appearing to be just outside the window. A seamless effect made possible by the model makers. Position noted and approved. Use your destructo ray. Explosive space battles have been showcasing models since Hollywood's early days. These Flash Gordon serials from the late 1930s presented some of the first dynamic clashes in space. Today, these interstellar battles have evolved to a new realm of realism, involving some of the most demanding and time-consuming effects work imaginable. Each model must be shot using a motion control camera system. Multiple passes allow Rob Legato to perfectly control the illumination and the film exposure for each set of lights on the model. When you shoot a model, we end up shooting about five passes. We do a beauty light pass, we do a matte pass, uh, and then every subsequent lighting pass after that, uh, blinking lights, uh, engines, or whatever, they're all shot separately. One final pass over a star background, and the shot is ready to be put together. Another challenge in shooting space battles is that none of the spacecraft can appear to be affected by gravity. In space, all matter is weightless, hence the term zero gravity. In filming the battle scene for Star Trek Deep Space Nine, Rob Legato must simulate a zero-gravity environment for a scene in which an enemy spacecraft blows a Federation starship out of the galaxy. Models are usually shot on an effect stage, but when the USS Saratoga is to explode, it must be shot on a larger sound stage at Paramount for safety reasons. The explosion must be substantial enough and produce plenty of debris to look believable. I know how big it is. Okay. I did, the last time I did this, we curved stage. Yeah. Okay. I, stood, I stood outside and debris went over my head. The first of three specially prepared breakaway models of the Saratoga is wrapped with explosive Primacord. This material is powerful enough to cut a 2 by 4 in half. To simulate the weightlessness of space, the model is suspended vertically and the camera is rigged to shoot up. This will cause the debris to drop toward the camera, giving the illusion of zero gravity. A sheet of Lexan, a high-impact plastic, is used to protect the lens. A fan is rigged next to the camera to ensure that the falling debris will not block the camera lens. It would be a shame if a piece of debris landed right on top of the shot and obscured the rest of the, of the fire and explosion of the ship. A high-speed camera is used so that the shot will play in slow motion, accentuating the sensation of zero-g. The explosion will seem brief to the naked eye, but filmed at 240 frames per second, it will last 10 seconds on the screen. It'll look like a, a little firecracker going off when you record it with the video camera, but when you see it on film, it'll, it'll look like a big yeah. explosion. Everyone takes his or her position as the explosive charges are made live. The high-speed camera revs up and locks in at 240 frames per second. That wasn't exactly the way we had in mind uh, when it exploded, so what we're going to do is uh, increase the explosion so it shatters more and then also cuts the wire so the ship is not left hanging. A second breakaway model is rigged with even more explosives and then suspended for the next take. The second explosion is better, but Rob feels he needs one more try. The next take will use the last model, so this will have to be the final attempt. It's a souvenir for a Star Trek convention. We're going to have these autographed and sent out. The final explosion completely destroys the starship. Yeah, that was great. That was worth waiting for. Usually, for some reason, everything goes in threes. You just, and on the third one, and we nailed it. Finally, the whole sequence is assembled, and the results are spectacular. Stand by for rehearsal. Action. Very good start. A landscape model involves entirely different concerns than a structural model like a starship or space station. With a landscape, Building a believable environment is more important than technical precision. 
Landscape miniatures are frequently used to create highly stylized locations. These Las Vegas miniatures from Francis Ford Coppola's One from the Heart were constructed on a soundstage where the lighting and camera moves could be carefully controlled. Another important use for miniature landscapes is to create logistically impossible environments, such as these Martian vistas from Total Recall. For Deep Space Nine, Rob Legato needs an uninviting stormy planet surface. Since no such location exists, Rob must create it entirely in miniature. People land on this planet or this planet surface. One looks out the window and sees a hellstorm. The other person, exactly the same time, sees a garden. And this whole motion control thing is set up because the hell reality is all miniature. It's all a 20 foot by 18 foot miniature landscape. The garden is the easy part. A Los Angeles park provides the perfect environment. For the miniature hell planet, Rob turns to award-winning model builder, Greg Jean. How much do these things go for? Expensive? <laughs> a veteran of the hunt for Red October, War Games, and Star Trek The Next Generation, Greg's crowning achievement would have to be the mothership he built for Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind. We just about finished it when uh, Steven decided he wanted to change the design and he called in Ralph McQuarrie to do some uh, sketches, who had just done a lot of work for uh, George Lucas up on Star Wars. And then uh, our shop made some little maquettes, and we sort of combined them both together and got that uh, sort of floating refinery in space look. Some of Greg's finest work has been with landscape miniatures. The scale landscapes of Los Angeles he built for Spielberg's 1941 were the largest project he has ever undertaken. 1941 was probably our most intricate set and uh, the one I liked the best. It was actually a miniature that uh, belonged in a museum rather than on a soundstage. The model making is basically a therapy to me. It's like basket weaving. If I don't do uh, something with my hands, I would probably uh, go nuts. For the Hell Planet landscape, Greg has model maker Mike Hosh carve the rough structures of the canyon cliffs out of eight foot pieces of foam. Hosh uses a light polyurethane foam, which is easy to sculpt in great detail. You just have to transfer in Sharpie okay. what areas we cut out so we can just start whacking it out. The canyon floor is first built from a denser, rigid urethane foam in a scaled-down version known as a maquette. Once we set that up, we can just start whacking away. Wire brush. The dimensions are later translated to larger pieces of the same material by his team of sculptors. And we're going to extend the bases so they drop and show more. Once the individual pieces are complete, they are assembled on a stage over the course of a day. It took Gene and his crew three weeks to create the 62 pieces that make up the Hell landscape. This is Hell, as you can plainly see. The Hell Planet landscape miniature will be shot with a variety of physical effects, which are used to create the illusion of a full-scale storm scene. As much Hell as we can afford is what we got. The timing of the lightning will be programmed into a computer. It must perfectly match what will later be shot on the live-action stage. The planet is blanketed with an eerie mist, created using liquid nitrogen, right. or LN2, which is kept under pressure at minus 320 degrees Fahrenheit. When all of the elements are brought together, the completed hell planet is a menacing sight. Mm, it's beautiful. You have a strange eye for beauty, Dax. Next, the stars of Deep Space Nine are brought in to play this dramatic scene. Dax, played by Terry Farrell, can only see a peaceful garden, while Avery Brooks as Cisco imagines he's on a hostile planet. The challenge for these actors is that they will see only a blue background. I am Commander Benjamin Sisko of the United Federation of Planets. <laughs> Later, all the blue will be replaced by images of the garden or the hell planet. I suppose the only way to prepare for blue screen is to go into your imagination, ultimately. I mean, you have to use your imagination all the time. Low-level ionic pattern. It's probing us. Someone's idea of shaking hands, maybe. 
Most of the time we speak to the actors and tell them what it is that we're going to put in because all they see is just blue or an X on a C-stand or something like that to where their eye line is going to be. And it's pretty hard for them to picture this exciting hellstorm when there's no, none of the elements are there. No, they haven't told me how they're going to create this shot. You're going to have to go and see too. <laughs> While the actors play the scene, Legato must keep the entire puzzle together in his head. The hard part is imagining all that in advance, saying, okay, this is what we really want to do, then break it up, says, okay, this is going to shoot here in a garden, this is going to shoot blue screen, this is going to shoot as a landscape miniature, this is going to be clouds, and figure out how it's all going to cut together and try to do it in some economic way. Creating a sequence this elaborate requires extensive planning and flawless execution. The results show that the effects team's efforts are rewarded. Models and miniatures are utilized to create a variety of different effects, whether a scene requires a mile-long space station, a stormy planet, or a fiery explosion. These resourceful craftspeople are counted on to deliver. The model building uh, today is just overwhelming uh, as far as the detail, the credibility, uh, compared to the models that were built and the way they were shot, uh, say, 25 years ago for, for Star Trek. As long as effects artists like Greg Jean, Rob Legato, and Tony Meininger are creating the star hardware, effect scenes featuring miniatures are sure to be a model of perfection.